Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Gerhardt, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, I will get you started with Class 16 Parameter Estimation when we have a one sample problem. So I'm going to go down to the timetable, page down to Class 16 Parameter Estimation for one sample. And we do have an RMD file here, a markdown file, and an HTML to uh, work on. So this is a separate assignment from our project. So let's open up the HTML file. You would download the markdown file and open that in our studio. For this um, walkthrough, I'll just look at the HTML. So this is a separate assignment, so do answer the questions in this document um, and upload the PDF of this document. Don't add it to your all document. So in class, so here's the question. How can we estimate the proportion of water on the globe, right, our Earth, using a beach ball shaped like the Earth <laughs> and with, the, it, with an image of the continents and everything on it? So in class, this is a fun uh, day because I bring in a beach ball and we think about how can we estimate the proportion of water. And typically I'd give you some points for, for determining the a good sampling strategy to pick points from from a sphere but let me just talk through what we typically uh, discuss All right so we've got to imagine a plastic beach ball oh. beach ball earth oops <laughs> I pressed enter too fast beach ball earthquake that's interesting alright so you buy one of these from the oriental trading company and okay looks like that okay look how much fun you could have so you got a big ball like this and now I want to estimate how much what proportion of the earth is covered with water okay so in class we often have a couple ideas one a strategy that often comes up early is that you could sample latitudes and longitudes and if you think about doing that you'll realize that the spacing, say for longitudes, those are the lines that run vertically on the ball. Longitudes are have a lot of space between, I think these are 15, are they 10 degree increments? Maybe 10 degree increments um, between the two vertical lines at the equator, but then they get quite narrow at the poles, and in fact they all converge right at the North Pole and the South Pole. So you end up, if you were to sample latitudes and longitudes, you would over-represent the poles and under-represent under the around the equator. So that's that's not a good sampling strategy. Um, a second suggestion often is that people want to cut the, the ball into pieces and then start to measure how much water is on each piece somehow. Uh, one way that I could imagine doing this, if you had a lot of time, is you could you could trim around the coastlines and and get pieces of earth and get pieces of water and you could even put them on a very sensitive scale and weigh the ball uh, the the fragments of the ball and so what I end up doing is I just toss the ball to someone and say um, where is your right pointer finger pointing to okay so you toss the ball and you catch it and you locate your right pointer finger over here somewhere and you say okay that's in water and then you toss it to someone else and the ball rotates around and their their pointer finger lands on Egypt okay and they say land then they toss the ball to someone else it flies around and the right pointer finger lands over here and it's in water they say water they toss it and so you start tossing the ball and by tossing and catching the ball and identifying where your right pointer finger has landed you can take a random sample of the surface of a sphere. And that's actually a pretty good way of, of sampling from a ball like this. So you don't get any points for answering that because I, here we've just had the discussion on, on, uh, on the video. I apologize that you don't get to toss the ball around. Uh, but you do get to uh, work on this question. How can this strategy be used to estimate the proportion of the globe covered by water? And I think I've given probably enough information, and you'll certainly get enough information below to answer this question. 
So uh, I start the answer by saying, assuming that we use strategy three, that's this one, uh, dot, 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 and I want you just to complete that sentence. All right. Next, um, so typically we would tally up how many, how many people got water, how many people got land, and uh, write that up on the board, and everyone would fill in some values. In this case, I'm going to use the data that we collected in a previous year, which ended up not being a very good estimate, but nonetheless, that's, that's what we got. So we're going to let n be the total number of observations. Okay, so we toss the ball. Uh, I forget how many times we did it. It looks like 35 times. And the num and x is going to be the number of successes. And here we're estimating the proportion of water. So success here is de defined as water. So we have successes is the number of water observations. Land here is considered failure, right? We have a in um, the in a test for proportion, which is what we're doing here. We're testing the, uh, or rather, we're estimating the proportion of water. We have a, a set of Bernoulli trials. A Bernoulli trial is a trial that ends with only a success or a failure, and then we estimate the proportion of successes. <clears throat> All right, so we can take these two numbers, n and x, right, number of successes and the number of, ops out of the total number of trials or observations, and we can put it into one of these two functions to make an estimate. Prop test is an approximation, which works well for when you have uh, large samples, and binome test is an exact test. Um, and the only the difference between these two is that the binomial test is based on the binomial distribution, which is the exact distribution for this uh, a sum of Bernoulli trials or a set of Bernoulli trials. And the prop test is based on the normal distribution, which is there's a normal approximation to the binomial distribution under um, certain conditions. Okay, so we're going to. Uh, load the tidyverse. We actually don't really need it in this case, but I uh, I reprogrammed this to be in tidyverse language. Anyway, we've got x here is the number of successes, and n was number of successes plus the number of failures. That's the total number. So we observed 21 successes out of 35 um, catches. So what I did is I created a, a tibble defined row-wise, which is what a triple is. I'm going to put that into DAC globe, and I'm just making this little tiny table down here. Okay, so I'm saying, what was the type? We got either water or land. What was the frequency? We either had X, which is the number of successes. That's the number of waters. And then N minus X must be 14. That's the number of lands. What's the proportion? Well, it's that frequency divided by the total number. And so we get this table, we ended up with 60% of the ob observations were land. I'll say that in uh, other years, we've, we've had estimates as high as 80%, um, maybe, even, maybe even higher. Um, and uh, one, one, point to, of, one point of distinction here is that we're actually estimating not the proportion of land uh, on the earth, but we're estimating the proportion of, or excuse me, the pro proportion of water on earth, we're estimating the proportion of water on the beach ball, right? So we, um, and, you know, provided that this beach ball estimates the earth well, the, the approximation should be pretty well. If we can estimate the water on the beach ball, it'll be a good approximation of the water on the earth. But just a sort of a small distinction there. We're not actually estimating water on the Earth, but on the just on the beach ball. <clears throat> All right. So here are the two um, tests. Here's prop test, where we fill in the number of successes, the number of trials, and then a confidence inter, inter, excuse me a confidence level for both a hypothesis test and a confidence interval. For this assignment, we're ignoring the hypothesis test. We'll cover that shortly. Um, but we're going to look at the confidence interval. I'm going to put the result of the proportion test into P summary and then print out the result here. 
there's a lot of a lot of words here, but it, uh, if you read them all, a lot of them make sense. One sample proportions test with continuity correction. So continuity correction is because this is a normal distribution and you're doing an approximation to a discrete binomial distribution. There's ways of improving that normal approximation, and one of those methods is by using a continuity correction. It's certain this is certainly beyond the scope of this class and this discussion. I'll just say that uh, this this works pretty well. <laughs> gives you a pretty good answer. Um, it says, what are the data? Well, we're looking at x out of n. So that's, you know, x out of n. That's the number of successes out of the number of trials. Okay. And that estimate was 0.6. That's what we calculated before up here, x over n. Um, there's a chi-squared statistic, degrees of freedom, p-value. We're not interested in any of that. Alternative hypothesis, we're not looking at a hypothesis test, so we can ignore that. Same thing on this top line, null probability, we're not looking at that. 95% confidence interval, this is what we care about. Here's a lower bound, 0.42, and here's an upper bound, 0.76. That's the confidence interval for the true population proportion of water on a beach ball. And then the sample estimate, that's what we observed, 0.6. That's the same thing we calculated. Um, there's also the result for using the binomial distribution. And um, same thing, binomial test. We put in X and in confidence level. There's a lot of the same results here. It does, in this case, tell you how many successes and the number of trials, which is nice. We ignore the p-value. We ignore the hypothesis test. We've got a confidence interval here, 0.42 and 0.76. You can see that those numbers are pretty close to up here. That's because we have a large enough sample size and we have a an estimated proportion that's pretty close to a half. Um, so it, it ends up, the approximation works quite well because the binomial distribution is very close to symmetric. Um, so this is the confidence interval that you would use, 0.42 up to 0.76. In this case, nicely, to two decimal places, the results match between these two. In practice, if you're doing this for your own research, I would recommend the binome test. The binomial test is going to give you an exact result. The only, the only reason I would not use it is if you had a very large sample size, like uh, thousands upon ten thousands, which would be very computationally intensive for this function, and the proportion test based on the normal distribution will give you effectively the same answer exactly. So, um, and this is this is very quick to compute, which is the reason for having it. Okay, all that to say, interpret the confidence interval for the proportion of water. Okay, and then you'll type your answer here. So I would refer to the lecture notes for a, the interpretation of a confidence interval for a one sample proportion. <clears throat> I'll sort of say what, how I would um, write this. Um, there is the lazy way, which um, makes it hard to interpret for other people who are non-statisticians. But one answer is we are 95% confident that the true population proportion of water is in the interval 0.42 to 0.76, period. The problem with that interpretation is the definition of confidence. Um, and uh, do I want to go into a discussion of confidence? Um, so uh, I hate confidence. <laughs> I hate confidence intervals um, because they're uh, um, so right. The thing that's random when you when you do an experiment is the data, right? You, you, if, if we were to um, run this experiment again, where we, we take, the, take our beach ball and we start tossing it around the room and we catch it and we, and we have, you know, either count how many waters and lands we get, then the thing that's going to be uh, random is the data that we collect through the random sampling. Once we collect our data, everything is fixed. 
And so the randomness comes from sampling. And the confidence interval, the, the interpretation of a confidence interval is that is, is that it is correct when you, when you do sampling and you calculate an interval, in 95% of samples, the true population proportion is inside this interval. Okay, so let's just stick with me for a second. I'm going to scroll up, and here's our data. All right, so we get out our beach ball and we toss it around, and in in one experiment we get 21 over 35. Let's say that we always do 35 trials, okay? And then we toss the beach ball again, and the next time we get uh, 26 out of 35, and then we toss the beach ball around again, and we get 24 out of 35, and we toss the beach ball around again, and we get 30 out of 35, etc. And you do this over and over and over again. Um, if you're a frequentist a statistician, you, you imagine that you do this an infinite number of times, which is a lot of tossing the beach ball. And if you do that over and over and over again, and each time you put in your data into the binome test function, and you calculate a confidence interval, there is, of course, a true proportion of water on this beach ball. And let's just say that it's 71% uh, or something. I, th I think that might be something close to what the actual water on Earth uh, percentage is. Okay. And so let's say that this beach ball is accurate and 71% of the water on Earth on the beach ball is water. So in each time we put in a sample of data, we get a different confidence interval. And this one, for example, contains 0.71. So this one was correct. And in fact, 95% of the intervals that we calculate, one based on each of the samples that we generated, each of those confidence intervals, 95% of them will contain 0.71, and some and 5% will not. Okay? So sometimes you get unlucky. You toss the beach ball around, and they, maybe you got uh, 15 out of 35. And maybe 15 out of 35 gives you um, a confidence interval. Uh, what the heck? Uh, do we have an R open? Let's close this. Do this. Binome test. Uh, f I forget what I said already. <laughs> 1435 and confidence level 0.95. Okay, so here's a confidence interval that does not include 0.71. That's one of the 5% of the intervals that I, uh, that I got wrong. Now, the, the challenging part here and the frustrating part, especially, uh, you know, the frustrating part for me is that this confidence interval is either correct or it's incorrect, meaning that it either contains the true value of 0.71 or it does not. However, the only... That the only information that we have is the data that we collected, 21 out of 35. So we, in most scenarios, we don't actually know the true value. We only know the data that we collect, and we're trying to estimate the true value. And we don't know whether this interval in includes the true value or it doesn't, because we're guaranteed only that 95% of the intervals when you sample data in this way, contain the true value. So that's the frustrating thing about confidence intervals. Here's our confidence interval, but it's either right or it's wrong. It either contains the true value or it does not, but you don't know. That's when you live your life as a frequentist statistician. I apologize, this is a quite a tangent. Um, if you are a Bayesian statistician, um, you get something called a credible interval. And in fact, in that case, you can actually interpret this as a probability. It's a whole other school of statistics. And uh, I'll put in my, uh, my vote that it is uh, the better of the, of the schools of st statistics. However, many people still use frequent st statistics because it is easier, easier to compute. Um, and doesn't require some additional special training and statistics to be able to do it. So um, for, for many of you, for your careers, you will continue to see confidence intervals 
um, I do encourage you to pursue Bayesian statistics. All right, so I will leave it there and say, interpret the confidence interval for the proportion of water. So here's another interpretation based on the discussion that I just had with myself <laughs> and you, of course. Um, in 95% of samples, okay, so that incorporates the 95% part. In 95% of samples, the confidence interval that we construct will contain the true value of the parameter, comma, our confidence interval was 0.42, comma, 0.76, period. That's maybe another way of, of saying it. Unfortunately, the, the interpretation, that first phrase, included no numbers. It's just basically a definition of the frequentist interpretation of a confidence interval. Um, this interval, uh, let me say outright, this interval does not say anything about the probability of the true proportion falling inside this interval. For example, we are not 95% um, we do not believe with we don't with 95% probability that the true value is inside this interval. That is not a correct interpretation because the true value is not random. It is a fixed value that's unknown. It's 71%. So it has no probability of being inside this interval. Furthermore, this interval doesn't have any probability or it has no randomness, right? Probability comes from randomness. So nothing's random after you've collected the data. The only thing that's random is the data collection. Okay, I will end that discussion. I believe it's a worthwhile discussion. It's just a lot of talking, a lot for you to listen to as you're staring at a white and black screen. All right, uh, let's do the last part. So I will note that almost all the interpretation or all the points are on the interpretation. All right, so here's a gimme. I've created a, a nice little plot down here. Let's see how nice it is. Oh, gorgeous. It goes from 0 to 1, and the estimate here is 0 0.60. Right, that was our estimated value. And then it has the bounds of the confidence interval. The lower bound, what was it, 0.42 up to 0.76. That is our confidence interval. And what I'd like you to do with that plot is label it. Here's a gimme. Label the plot. I want you to get, label the title, x-axis, y-axis. Uh, let's talk through real quick how I label this plot or how I create this plot. Um, I've got uh, the code for the plot. I put in the that little data table and I filter out just the water row, right? Filter selects rows <clears throat> and where, where type equals water. So if I page up for a second and look at that table, this filter looks only at this one row and I'm only plotting that one number, that proportion. 0.6. So we're doing a lot of uh, programming to plot one number. But that's what that's what a bar plot is. This bar plot, all this black ink, represents one number, 0.6, just the top of it. This is why bar plots are such an inefficient method for plotting data, because there's a lot of ink used for a single number. Anyway, so I've, I've taken the DAT globe, filtered it just to the row equaling water, um, x equals type, that's this x-axis down here that's labeled water. The height of the bar y is the proportion, that's 0.6. Um, and then geom bar is what plots that proportion. Uh, stat identity just sort of puts it right here. There's some other options, but that's the right one to use. Um, I changed it from black to gray 60, which is 60% gray, which is, I think... I think gray zero is all black, and the number here represents sort of how much white there is. So gray 40 would be lighter. Gray 20 would be a very light gray. Um, and I'm modifying the fill color because the fill is what um, is on the inside of the bar. Um, I've put in these horizontal lines at one and zero. That's just the horizontal line at the bottom, that gray line there, and this gray line up here, just to help demarcate 
what the bot what the possible bottom and tops are and then I've got error bar geom error bar what you need to specify is the minimum value and the maximum value and optionally I specify the width to be one quarter um, the width of the full bar here okay so if you ch if you make that bigger you'll have wider um, tails on your error bar all right um, and then I just uh, scale the y-axis to have limits going from 0 to 1. All right, the only bit of magic here, <laughs> that's an overstatement, is uh, specif determining what the confidence, lever con confidence interval bounds are. Okay, so let's scroll up for a moment. Recall from the binome test, this was stored in B underscore summary, and in here there are the values the lower and upper bounds for the confidence interval. So if, uh, one trick you can use when, it, when you're looking for values that were produced from a function, you can look at the names of the object. So in this object, there's a bunch of pieces. There's a statistic, which is uh, like a Z statistic or something. Let's see if it's even provided up here. Um, I, think the Z, I think the statistic actually is like 21 or in this, in this particular case. Uh, parameter, the p-value there is this p-value here. Um, the confidence interval is what we want. Okay, and that contains two numbers. So um, we found that the object that we want, confidence interval, so then we look at b summary dollar sign confidence interval to look at that object inside b summary. And it, the result of that are these two numbers. And you can get at each one of them by specifying the first index. That's 0.42. That's this number here. And then the second index, 0.76, is down here. So we know how to get those individual values, which means we can grab the, fir the, the first value here with the bracket 1 and put that in down here. The minimum value is confidence interval bracket 1. The maximum value is confidence interval bracket 2. And that's what puts that confidence interval in there. The nice thing about this, and you might just experiment with this. I'm going to page up for a moment. If you change x and n, right? The only data are these are these two numbers, 21 and 14. In fact, I should have just put x right here. Um, so if you change those two numbers, everything else just calculates. So go ahead and uh, just play a little bit. Change these change these numbers and see how the the confidence interval changes and the bar changes on this plot. It will always, of course, the confidence interval will always be centered roughly on the on the middle of of the or on the top of the bar. But you, sometimes you can get it up high, sometimes you can get it down low. In fact, if you get it close to one or close to zero, the confidence interval should be asymmetric. It sort of when it gets say when it gets down to zero, it sort of scrunches. It's the top of the bar is say point point oh five. The lower bound might be point oh two, but then the upper bound might be as high as like point one five or something, depending on the sample size. All right, so that's a lot. Last say all you need to do here is is for you, for this last question. If I page up for a moment, is label the plot, and so you just need a um, a new, another line where you have labs with a title, X and a Y, and give this a nice title and give it some nice labels. All right, so that was a long discussion for a fairly simple um, homework, but I did discuss confidence intervals for quite some time. So I'm sorry that we didn't get to toss a beach ball around. That's one of the highlights of the class, typically. All right. Goodbye.